I wanted to, uh, um, one more thing this week, just in terms of our own um, preparation for Easter, preparing our hearts and our minds and what's leading us up and through this week, is that um, we have written a series of devotions this week that you'll um, get notifications. If you have the app, that'll come through there. If you don't get the notifications, it'll be in your inbox. And they're, they're just short devotions to help prepare our hearts for the celebration of Easter, to kind of take us on a journey um, this week and, and to remind us of what God has done on our behalf and continues to do. And so be looking for those this week. Again, you'll find those on your app and, and, um, and we think you'll be blessed by those. We encourage you um, to have a look for that. Maybe you have experienced this, but um, misplaced assumptions lead to unmet expectations, right? Mis misplaced assumptions lead us to unmet expectations. For instance, um, one of the examples I've seen of this in my uh, life is almost actually almost exactly 20 years ago to this day, May 19th of 1999. Does anybody know what happened on that day? The Phantom Menace was released. <laughs> The, the next series, so Star Wars fans had been waiting for years for the next story to be released. And the assumption that we were operating under is that George Lucas is a sci-fi genius, right? That was the premise that we were all, so there was all this expectation for what the Phantom Menace was going to be like. Nerds lined up in mass in outfits, stayed up all night, got in line for the movie, wanted to see it as soon as it was released. And there was across the board, almost like utter disappointment. And what that movie was, the story that was told, some of the characters, it was like this, this huge sense of letdown because we had misplaced assumptions. There was expectations. Every family vacation you've ever gone on is an example of this, <laughs> right? Where you think, man, this is gonna be so relaxing. I just can't wait to get away. The family's gonna bond. And then like 30 seconds in, like one of your kids is strangling the other one and then you wanna strangle all of them. And, and, and it doesn't quite live up to, to what you anticipated it would be. See, today is, is, is the beginning of our celebration of Holy Week. As, as today we, we remember and talk about Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, leading us up through um, the Last Supper that he shared with his disciples, and then what happens on Good Friday, and, and then the crucifixion, and, and ultimately culminating in the resurrection or celebration of Easter together as a community. And we've spent the last six weeks talking about Old Testament prophets and how they were looking at this from their perspective uh, of, of what was to come and talking about who the Messiah would be, all this anticipation that was in the people and God's promised deliverance. And when they tried to picture who the Messiah would be and, and what he would do for the people of Israel, they talked about how he would be their, their one true king. And so now as we look at this passage together in the book of Luke, as Jesus is being paraded into Jerusalem, we see the people collectively gathered around this event and saying together, behold, the king has arrived, the king has come. And yet, as we'll discover, wrong assumptions will lead to unmet expectations. Now, it's interesting to note that this one week of the life of Christ comprises about a quarter of the entirety of our Gospels. And so, for instance, the, the birth of Christ is, is mentioned in a couple chapters here and there. The, the early preparation and youth of Christ and then his early ministry years is, is just a few chapters more. And yet this one single week 
of, of, of the life of Christ from, from what we're going to look at today where he is entering into Jerusalem, where Jerusalem is celebrating Passover, Jesus is eating with his disciples, where he's betrayed, and there's all of these mock trials, there's, there's torture, and there is, there's mockery, and there's crucifixion, and again, it just ends in this culmination of death being overcome. And when you read through the Gospels, you see that the, the Gospel writers, they're directing us to this point. That, it, that it's all sort of been leading here. This is central to what they want us to understand, and it's central to our faith as well. From the time of the Old Testament prophets, they were pointing us to this moment. From the time the Gospel writers went, sat down to share the story, they were leading us to this moment, what Christ would accomplish on the cross and what he would overcome in the resurrection. So let's turn to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. We're gonna pick things up in verse 28. Let's read this together. This is what's commonly known as, as the triumphal entry. It says, after Jesus had said this, he's been talking with his disciples. It says, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, and as he approached Beth, uh, Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. And those, were sent, those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. See, as we, as we enter into this scene, we discover that it begins with a coronation. This, this, what we have in front of us is, is a coronation of a king. The, imagine that, that moment in time where, where your whole life has been leading to this place, where you have been waiting your whole life for this moment, for this thing to happen. This is where the people of Israel are at. Like the closest example that I can come up with to where we have experienced this was with the Cubs winning the World Series, <laughs> right? Like there was this collective energy with the exceptions to the White Sox fans. I apologize. I know like Eric is going to send me strongly worded emails this week. But there was this collective energy as all of this was happening. And if you watch, I, I am a Cubs fan, but I'm a, I'm a, a late bloomer Cubs fan. I didn't, until I went to Moody and lived in Chicago, it really started to take an interest in the Cubs. Those of you who are Cubs fans from the day you were born, the, the, this, this moment was so big for you. And if you remember watching the, the um, parades in downtown Chicago, like there's, there's been, I don't know if it's true or not, but statistics that talk about this being one of the top 10 largest gatherings of human beings in the world. Like this is the moment all of Chicago has waited for, for generations, for life. And it begins to help us understand what is unfolding here in Luke chapter 19. As, as this coronation begins to take place, if you can imagine yourself being in this moment where you're living in occupied Rome, but you know from your family, from your tradition, what the prophets had promised. And now there's all this buzz and there's this energy in the city. There's this collective sense together that this moment, this, these things that are happening, this is what we've been waiting for our whole lives. This is the moment. Now, there's a couple of things I, I want to point out here that, that I think help inform the sense of what takes place here. One is that when Jesus is preparing his disciples for this moment, 
He, he speaks to them in, in no uncertain terms. Like he, he, he attempts to establish their expectations correctly. If you turn over to Luke chapter 18, um, in verse 31, Jesus is speaking with his disciples and he tells them this. He says that Jesus took the 12 aside and he told them, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the son of man will be fulfilled and he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and they will mock him, insult him and spit on him and they will flog him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. But then it says, and the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them and they did not know what he was talking about. So Jesus is telling his disciples as we're heading into, Jeru into Jerusalem to fulfill everything that the prophets have told us about. When we read Isaiah chapter 53 together, when there's this picture of the suffering servant and Jesus is saying, this is what we were told was going to happen is now happening. And so they ride into Jerusalem with this full awareness of, of what's supposed to take place and yet they don't get it. In fact, it says in the text that, that it was hidden from them. See, the disciples here, they are growing in their understanding of who Jesus is. They're getting this fuller picture, and yet they, they remain naive to the implications of what it means for Jesus to be Israel's Messiah, what it means for him to be their long-awaited king. They, they continue to see Jesus at, at least partially through these lens of, of false assumptions, which I think begs the question, do we? D does, does our understanding of Jesus, is it informed by, by who he said he is and what he said he came to do? Or do, do we do similar things where he'll say in sometimes no uncertain terms, this is why I'm here and this is what I've come to do. And yet we can we can look the other way and say, well, but this, this image, this idea, this understanding of Jesus, I wanna, I wanna hold on to that. The second thing that takes place here that, that has fed into this moment in Luke 10, uh, 19 is again recorded just before this. Jesus is on his way into Jericho now. This is in verse 35. And it says, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting on the road begging. And when he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. And when all the people saw it, they also praised God. See, uh, at first glance, it appears to be in just another incidence, right? Where Jesus sees somebody and they call out in the midst of their desperate need for him. And Jesus stops in his grace and mercy and, and heals them. And yet there is, there is more to this story than immediately meets the eye because, because this man calls out to Jesus in this very specific, very significant way. He, he says, Jesus, son of, of David. Now, for most of us, we can read right past that. But when that man said that in that moment, there would have, that would have not gone unnoticed by anyone standing there. Because the phrase son of David is a specific messianic kingly title. In this moment here, this is the first time ever that Jesus has publicly allowed this title to be applied to him. You can see the response by some of Jesus' followers. They're, they're trying to, hey, 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 let's not do anything crazy here. But Jesus receives it. Jesus allows in this moment to be referred to as the son of David. It's not, it's not just a kingly title. It, it, it is the title that the Jews knew referred to the one who would be the ultimate king. And Jesus is taking it on. 
For the first time in his ministry, Jesus is allowing himself to be identified as the ultimate king. This, to say that this moment is significant is, is, is a drastic understatement. This is, there's no going back at this point. This, this is the moment where Jesus, to allow this title to, to be applied to him, he now must go and take his throne or to be guilty of blasphemy and, and to experience the consequences of it. And as you can imagine, they're living in occupied Rome. Roman rulers and authorities aren't big fans of somebody marching in and, and, and claiming the title of the ultimate king. And so now Jesus is setting his eyes towards Jerusalem and all that, that waits for him there. And as he does, there's this coronation, this crowning of the king that begins to happen. Jesus instructs his disciples to go and to get a colt and they place him on the colt and he's ushered into Jerusalem again in the Hebrew mind. You're just picturing Solomon when David is declaring that Solomon will be the one to replace him as king and he sets him on the colt of a donkey and he parades him into Jerusalem and it's, it's happening all again. This coronation scene, it's a direct fulfillment of, of Zechariah chapter nine. The prophet said it this way, he said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Jesus is the fulfillment of their hope for a king. This is his purpose in riding into Jerusalem on a colt. It's this very public display that he has come to be their Messiah, to be their ultimate king. But as, as we will soon see, their assumptions about what that means, what it looks like, what it will require of him to be their king, they're, they're misguided, they're misunderstood. And when those expectations go unmet, shouts of Hosanna and shouts of rejoice will quickly turn to shouts of, of crucify him. See, this, this coronation scene is, is shouts of rejoicing and hosanna, but even here in the midst of this, there's also this moment of, of rejection, of a rejection. I don't know if you've ever experienced one of those moments when you're looking for something and you walk in and, and you just cannot see it, but it's right in front of you. Does that ever happen to you? Like, it seems to be happening to me with growing frequency. Um, but I can remember as a kid, um, the, the Christmas morning that I received my red Schwinn 10-speed bike. Like, this is like a whole new level of freedom for me, right? I was about 10 years old, and, um, and so because a big 10-speed bike is hard to wrap, my parents had set it in kind of this, the front room of our house and put a big bow on it. And, and we were opening presents in a different room. And so my dad was kind of setting me up to, to go discover the bike. And my uh, younger brother was opening one of his presents and it, it needed batteries. And so he said, hey, hey, Sterling, why don't you go look for batteries in the front room? And so I was like, okay, you know, I, and he's knowing that I'm gonna go in there and, and see my bike. And I walk in there and like a couple of minutes later, I come back and I said, I don't see any batteries, dad. <laughs> he goes, why don't you go look again, you know? It was sitting in the middle of the room with a bow on it. And, and I walked right past it. See, this is, as we watch this whole scene unfold, there's those in the audience, they're, they're, they're misguided in their view of what it means to be Jesus, that Jesus is going to be king, but they understand the coronation. They're a part of it, they're rejoicing in it. There's a whole nother crowd that's missing it entirely. If you look back in, in uh, Luke 19, verse, picking it up back in verse 38 again, the crowds are shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So, but, and then verse 39, but some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Like you, you can cut the tension with a knife in, in what's taking place here. The disciples have been urging Jesus to, to, to go and claim his rightful title. They, they've been waiting for this moment. 
They've been seeing it come, but on the other hand, the Pharisees are absolutely enraged. They, they are now more committed than ever to shutting Jesus and his followers down for what they perceive to be a fraud. See, what's interesting again in this is that both of them are operating from this false sense, these misguided assumptions about Jesus and ultimately about themselves as well. For the disciples, the followers of Jesus, this, as we said, this is the moment that they have been waiting for. And again, if you can imagine the scene with Passover in Jerusalem, people have come from everywhere. They've gathered in this city. There's this messianic buzz as the word about Jesus of Nazareth has gone out. There's a stir. People have gathered together to celebrate this moment. And then there's this this response by, by Israel's spiritual leaders. They react very differently. In fact, they're outraged that, that all of this is being allowed to take place. That this, this brazen claim of power and authority as Israel's rightful king is, is happening in front of them. Because in their mind, this is not how this is supposed to happen. In their mind, this isn't what this looked like. They had the same anticipation. They lived with the same sense of, of expectation, but it wasn't going to look like this. When Messiah comes, he would, he would operate through the proper channels. That, that, that they would be in these important meetings, that they as Israel's spiritual leaders, that they would have a, a seat at the table. That their power and their authority as, as Pharisees would grow when Messiah comes not be diminished. That they would be the ones leading this parade into Jerusalem, not a bunch of fishermen and, and, and tax collectors. In their minds, Jesus can't be the son of David. He can't be the ultimate king because he didn't need them in order to make it happen. So they shout out, stop, stop this charade. Rebuke your disciples, Jesus. But Jesus won't do it. He will not because what's taking place here in the moment, the, the truth that is being proclaimed is so vital and so powerful that he says if the crowds, if they failed to recognize this moment, he says then creation itself would rise up to do so. And essentially Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, that look, inanimate creation understands and knows more about what's happening right here and right now than you do as Israel's spiritual leaders. The rocks know more. So if you fail to, to stand up and to recognize him as such, then, then creation itself will do it. Again, I want to I pause here for a moment. Because I think what's happening in these verses, in these surrounding crowds as they begin to realize that they have all these expectations of Jesus and yet as the week unfolds their understanding of what that would look like and what that would mean for them begins to to be in conflict with those assumptions those expectations go unmet and I, I think it I think it, it it reveals different ways that we approach Jesus that where sometimes we approach Jesus as as a fan where, where, where when, when we see him acting in ways that align with our understanding, our assumptions about who he is and what he came to do, then, then we're there in that moment and we're celebrating and we're, and we're praising and we're proclaiming and it's happening, it's all real. But as soon as those expectations go unmet, the approach to Jesus turns quickly. And, and what was once worship and praise becomes something altogether different. See, there's something distinctive about the difference between being a fan of Jesus and being a follower of Jesus. See, to be a follower of Jesus, he, he decides the path. He knows what he's entering into in Jerusalem. Even when it looks nothing like what we've imagined, even when it looks nothing like this is how this should go, we respond to him in worship, not because he's meeting our expectations or he's operating according to our terms, but because he is our king. Because we follow him because of, of who he is. So I, I was reading through this and, and recognizing 
both within our culture, but I think more poignantly with, within the context of my own heart, the way sometimes I, I look at Jesus and I respond to him more as a fan than I do as a follower. And, and the result of that is, is devastating. As this passage continues, we discover that, that Jesus responds to everything that he sees unfolding around him with a deep grief. A deep grief. This is back in Luke chapter 19. Picking it up now in verse 41. He says, as he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when you, when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. And they will dash you to the ground and your children within your walls. And they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus paints this ominous picture of what's in front of them because they're missing it. And he responds to all of it with this deep grief. I, I've experienced as a youth pastor, um, I've experienced it just as, as a friend. When you're watching somebody make decisions that you know are devastating, that you know the consequences that lay in front of them, and you might have, you might have conversations with them. Some of our, our, our high school, middle school students, maybe you guys have experienced this. In, in real time where you're watching a friend who's doing something that you know where this leads, you know the end result of it is not good and there's this sense of almost mourning that wells up inside of you as a result of all this. And this is what Jesus is experiencing but just on this, this uh, level that is beyond anything we can comprehend. Notice the contrast in these verses. In the midst of all of this celebration, these shouts of rejoicing and praise, Jesus grieves. Why do the people rejoice when the Savior weeps? See, Jesus now is, is overlooking Jerusalem and he sees what they can't. Jesus knows that so many of these people whom he loves, who, who he is coming to rescue, that they're missing it. He knows that the peace that he is going to bring won't come by military force. It's not going to come by, by the strength of, of, of an army. He knows that his kingdom will not arrive through the defeat of, of Israel's political enemies. He knows that his kingdom will come through sacrifice. Jesus understood that his greatest triumph would come through the world's greatest tragedy. And he weeps because there's so many who are missing it, because there's so many who have failed to understand what it means for him to be Messiah and when their expectations go unmet, instead of, of gaining a fuller understanding of who he is, they will reject him. And as a result, he, he grieves. So how do we, how do we make sense of, of everything that's taking place on this day, in that moment, some 2,000 years ago? From beginning to end, the passage is detailing this triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And it does, as it does so, it reveals to us a paradoxal king. The one who, although the, the wind and the waves obey his every command, the one who the very forces of evil will leave in his presence, although he can speak healing with a word and give life when death has come in, Jesus will not take his throne by a display of political power, but by rather by his death and resurrection. Jesus redefines what it means to be a king. He, he won't conquer by the power of an army. He will conquer by the means of grace and love and sacrifice. And this paradoxical king in that moment is going to under, usher in a paradoxical kingdom. A kingdom where the first will be last. A kingdom where the greatest among us will be a servant of all. A kingdom that will not just offer temporal peace and momentary victory, but one that offers us eternal life. And on this day, Outside of Jerusalem, a paradoxical king rode in on a colt, 
so that we would know that he was coming as the one true king. Behold the king.